Ladies and gentlemen, what's up? Getting ready to start our weekend. Time for a little bit of Q&A. Let's talk about the brands that help make this podcast possible. The first one is on it, which going back, maybe one of the first brands to ever sponsor the podcast. Uh, and I used their products for quite some time, long before they had ever reached out on a professional front on the recommendation of Senor Joe Rogan, uh, who is a part of on it as well. If you're interested in total human optimization, really, really trying to dial in that last 10 to 15%, go to onit.com slash hot. You'll know you're in the right place because you're going to see the podcast artwork. It's actually the old artwork, but right across the top, supplements, nutrition, fitness, apparel, sale, and then content, written, spoken, visual, whatever type of content you want. I'm going from right to left here. Apparel, that's self-explanatory. Fitness, everything in there from equipment to uh, programs. And then there's nutrition and supplements. On the main landing page are three that I use, one being Alpha Brain, which is kind of their flagship product. It's a nootropic, helps you with memory focus and processing speed. I don't take it every day because I actually want it to work. And yes, I actually do feel a difference on the days that I do take it. Power Food Active, it's a uh, protein powder, but it also has a host of micronutrients to support your body. And then the total gut health. This is something I've struggled with kind of off and on for quite some time. Uh, gut health. And so I try to take that regularly and I find that it makes a huge difference. So when you're ready, again, to optimize yourself, not pour supplementation down the garbage disposal of an unhealthy diet and lifestyle, hoping that it's going to save the day. When you're ready, onit.com slash hot for all of your total human optimization needs. This episode is also brought to you by one of my favorite brands, Christensen Arms. I'm so fired up to be working with them. Their claim to fame, they are the original creators of the carbon fiber rifle barrel. And if you've never shot a rifle that has a carbon fiber barrel, well, you're missing out. One, from a weight perspective, but two, from a cooling perspective. It makes a huge difference. Christensen they are the makers of the lightest and most accurate rifles in the industry. They have sent me two MPRs, one in 308, one in 300 Wim Mag, and an additional Ridgeline Titanium that I'm still yet to put together. I'm going to do a whole video series on how I take it out of the box and get it ready to go into the field. I'm waiting on my bipod. So just shortly, soon after this, hopefully, maybe even next week, I'm going to be able to do this. Their rifles are amazing. If you want to check out their suite of rifles, go to ChristiansenArms.com. Now... Here's the thing, though. Not everybody knows what they're looking for when it comes to a rifle. And everybody pretty much wants the best rifle for their intended personal use. Christensen Arms, they realize this, and they make it. They want to make it easy for you to find that perfect rifle without the hassle or having to Google some gun jargon or to spend hours doing research. So they created the Find My Firearm tool. It's a short questionnaire that will match you with the firearm that's going to meet your needs. You can take this quiz at christiansenarms.com slash findmyfirearm, or again, go to christiansenarms.com, and it's one of the options that you can select from. Like I said, I should have a video coming out shortly that goes from flash to bag, in the box to going bang out in the field, and then I plan on hunting with it later this year for deer. And that is it. Let's dig into this. we got Full Loto Friday 56 coming at you. All right, let's do this. I get four questions for today. Yep, one, two, three, and then four. That's how that works. I got four. They're a touch longer, and I want to be respectful of everybody's time to include my own. It's almost the weekend. So let's go through these four different topics. Away we go. Subject line for the first one, negative interaction with law enforcement. Do I need to check my ego? Of course, interested. And we begin. I recently got pulled over for speeding. The circumstances of that do not matter. I was in the wrong and I own that. I'm a huge fan of Jocko Willink and I own and have read Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership. I'm going to stop right here and say for those of you listening, if you haven't read those two books, I can't recommend them enough. Continuing on, and I practice extreme ownership in my life. I take ownership in everything in my world, and more people need to practice this concept. Couldn't agree with you more. 
I did the right thing when I was pulled over. I immediately pulled over, rolled down my windows, and gripped the steering wheel because we all know law enforcement wants to see your hands. The state trooper asked for a license and insurance. I handed her that along with my concealed carry card. She immediately yelled at me asking, where is it? I told her I had an ankle carry and another firearm in the door jam. She ran over to my driver door, and in parentheses, she was originally on the passenger side, and yanked my gun out of the holster and grabbed the other by the door. Without explaining what or why, then took my tools back to her car and ran serial numbers. The law in my state does not require that you notify law enforcement of a firearm, nor does it even require a CCW to carry. I handed her that card to show her I wasn't a jerk, that I was a good guy, can pass a background check, etc. I was basically treated like a criminal for handling for handing her my CCW card, which wasn't even asked for, nor was I asked if there were any weapons in the car prior to that. I am just extremely provoked, but hurt, whatever you want to call it. I did the right things and was treated like crap. I did not file any kind of complaint. I'm not that kind of person. Long story short, don't speed and you won't have to worry about getting pulled over in the first place. And I get it. The ticket was for 84 in a 60. I'm not bad about the ticket. I own that. But I just can't wrap my head around the idea that my ego is hurt. Or if this person is just a small percentage in law enforcement that are total jack wagons. In my mind, she needs to check her ego and slow down on the authoritative attitude. I always supported law enforcement, but I can't say the same after this happened. Huge fan of the podcast, and I love your feedback. The good bumper sticker that I have on my vehicle didn't help, but either way, I say good. Damn, a lot going on here. First off, how do you know the good bumper sticker that you have on your vehicle didn't help? Unless she directly said something about that, you know, maybe don't make an assumption on that. And I'm going to work this from the end back to the beginning. I always supported law enforcement, but I can't say the same after this happened. I would give you the same advice that I give anybody when they are interfacing with an individual from a community, and that is take your individual interaction as that, not a blanket interaction of the entire community as a whole. Obviously, the interaction that you had did not live up to the expectation that you had from law enforcement, and that happens. I've had those interactions as well, but... What I try to do is keep it in the back of my mind that I'm dealing with a human being and human beings, we all have good days and we have bad days. And I think you might have caught this woman, this officer on one of her bad days, because this behavior for a few reasons is a little bit disturbing to me. Now, mind you, I'm not a police officer, so I'm going to give some feedback on this just based on my my take from a tactical perspective and a situational awareness perspective. Uh, on her side, but I think it's safe to say, um, you know, maybe we could rate this interaction as a, a C minus or a, or a D plus. Having said that, don't let it taint your overall perception of law enforcement. If you would have had an officer who came up and was incredibly professional and it went exactly the same way that you had wanted it to, you probably would still have a great perception of law enforcement, and you would have had uh, the support that you talked about in your email. And that's awesome. But again, don't base it on just that one interaction, because the next time you got pulled over, you could have the exact opposite or back and forth or everywhere in between. We're dealing with human beings, treat them as a human being and not necessarily representative as the community as a whole. Okay. In my mind, she needs to check her ego and slow down on the authoritative attitude. Uh, I obviously wasn't there and I can't hear the way that she was speaking or the attitude that she presented to you, but I don't know if what happened is based in ego. One thing that I can say with my relationships and friendships that I have with law enforcement and the amount of time that I get to spend with them, which where I live and the fact that I train about a block from this studio, actually, there are law enforcement officers on the mat. So I think I get a a pretty good amount of time interfacing and talking with them uh, when they're off duty. And I've also done a ride along uh, in the past, not up here in uh, Kalispell. So I have a slight understanding of what they do on duty. And the point of me saying all of that is you really don't know what has gone into somebody's day when they approach your vehicle. Uh, And talking to my close friends up here, 
you know, they'll go on a call that might be uh, a petty theft with no violence involved at all, and then a domestic violence call where there are, you know, serious and grave injuries to a suicide, to a car accident where children are literally dead in the street, or then they need to go and notify, uh, you know, a minor killed. They need to go notify the parents. They're still on their shift. And then the next thing you know, they're pulling somebody over for speeding. I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of coping mechanisms that you have. That type of stuff is going to weigh on you. And this individual, she may have experienced some of that or none of that at all. But you never know what has gone on in her day, what leads her up to your car door. Now, I'm not trying to justify her actions. I'm just saying maybe give her just a little bit of grace because she could have been exposed to fill in the blank in the course of her ship and her cup could be damn near getting ready to spill over. As far as her behavior, um, and actually I'm going to go to yours first. When you pulled over, you do exactly what I do when I get pulled over. If it's uh, daytime, all the windows go down. Obviously, the vehicle is in park. I will oftentimes turn it off. Hands are on the steering wheel. I do carry and I do have weapons in the car. I don't personally present my uh, concealed weapons permit. Um, I do know, though, here in Montana, if you have a concealed weapons permit, when they pull you over and they either run your license or I think it might also be associated with your vehicle registration, there is an outline on the screen of your picture, which shows that you have a concealed weapons permit. So they're going to figure out either way, but I'm also not required to uh, be upfront or uh, disclose that I have a CCW or a weapon in the car. I personally choose not to, not because I'm trying to avoid anything, but if they ever ask me to step out of the car or they wanted to go beyond checking my license and registration, at that point, I would inform the officer because at that point, it's very likely that they're going to visually see uh, the weapon I either have in the car or on myself. So you did exactly what I do uh, when pulling over because what I'm trying to do is put the officer at ease. I have walked up on vehicles in a different capacity. Obviously, I was never a law enforcement officer, but approaching a vehicle you're at a tactical disadvantage. There are a lot of blind spots. If people are being uh, resist, resistant in the form of trying to hide their hands, uh, dig into pockets, hide things in the vehicle, it's very hard for you to see that until you're very, very close, which is not obviously tactically to your advantage. And I'm trying to reduce any stress to the officer that is approaching the vehicle. And the only thing I would add is if this happens in the evening or low light situations, I also will turn on the dome light and just sit there and wait for the officer to approach. Yes, sir. Uh, no, ma'am. Whatever it may be. Um, so I support what you did uh, from that perspective. Now, her approaching the passenger side, I think that's pretty common. I've actually had it happen um, on both sides. And I think it might have to do with the flow of traffic or where they park their vehicle. I'm actually not sure. Uh, her reaction, though, when you handed her the CCW card, your concealed carry card, yelling at you, where is it? And then when you tell her, her running from one side of the vehicle to the other, yanking the uh, the gun out of the holster and grabbing uh, the other one that's by the door without explaining what she is doing or why. Uh, that one, I have a little bit more difficulty trying to figure out exactly what it is that she was doing. From my pers perspective, you know, if, if she feels like it's a threat what I would do in that situation would be utilize my radio. I probably would create space and distance. Uh, I probably would go back to the vehicle. I would radio in for backup uh, as opposed to running around your vehicle and opening your door and grabbing a weapon off of you. Uh, and again, I don't know the law and I don't know uh, what authorities this individual has, but I'm just saying from my, from my own non-law enforcement background, if I felt a threat in this situation, I would utilize space and distance and probably put something that is bullet resistance in between the two of us and call for backup uh, as opposed to taking the tools away from you and then going back to her car and running the serial number because here's my question on that while she's head down running the serial number how the hell does she know that there's not a third weapon in the car that, that was one of the biggest things that stuck out to me in this email is that she took the two tools that you told her about and then went back to her car if she truly felt threatened, again, I'm going to go back to getting on the radio and, you know, calling for backup or whatever terminology you would want to use, maybe just another set of eyes or another officer on scene. 
What I wouldn't do is go back into my vehicle. I mean, did she check your glove box? Did she check the center console? Did she check underneath your seat? If he truly feels like a threat, pull the individual. If you're going to do it by yourself, get the individual out of the car, cuff them, put them in a location where you can control that and then search the vehicle. Because if you're not going to do that, I don't really know what's running through your head. Um, Again, I'm not a law enforcement officer. I'm not trying to critique this individual's actions. I'm, well, I guess I am to a degree, but my critique comes from a non-law enforcement perspective. I'm just very concerned about this particular behavior. Uh, I don't know if I would say you were treated like a criminal. What I would say is you were treated in a manner that is more descriptive of her headspace than how she may think of you. The behavior and the reaction to the weapon, it I don't know if this individual, again, was coming towards the end of a shift and maybe she had a very horrendous experience with somebody in this exact same situation within 60 minutes of encountering you. Maybe she was scared. Uh, maybe she was new on the job. I don't know, but I don't think she was trying to treat you like a criminal. I think it was a poor execution of her roles and responsibilities. Um, it sucks. Uh, there, again, a lot of things here. My, most of my concern is in in the conduct of the officer from that situational awareness perspective or that tactical perspective. To be honest, you know, if you're extremely provoked and butt hurt, I don't know what to tell you about that. You dealt with somebody who gave you a, a substandard performance of what you thought it was going to be, and I think you probably should just get over that. You didn't get treated like a criminal. You didn't get cuffed. You didn't get pulled out of your vehicle. Again, I'm not going to try to justify her actions or behavior, but do the best that you can to give this individual a little bit of grace and maybe view it from the perspective of you don't know what has happened up until that point in time. And at the end of the day, the best advice I can give you is treat it like an individual interaction and try not to judge the community as a whole. And if you get pulled over again, what I would recommend is you do exactly the same thing again. Because what I think, in my opinion, what you did was correct. Uh, the improvement in this situation can come from the law enforcement side of the house. And at, you know, I'm going to go back to your subject line here. Do I need to check my ego? No, this is not an ego related situation. This is uh, an interaction that could be better. You were doing the right thing. Continue doing that. That's the advice that I would give you. And hopefully your next interaction is improved. Question two. This one's a little bit of a long one as well. Subject line, how to handle a shitty ex situation. <laughs> well, well, well. First off, I'm not an expert at this. Uh, and this email, whew, it uh, I'm not going to say it hits close to home, but I can feel the pain for this individual. If you have the time, I'd like some advice or words of wisdom in dealing with my ex-wife's soon-to-be husband. Some background. I've been divorced for two years, and I have three girls, ages 15, 17, and 19 with my ex. My God, man. Three girls. All teenagers. That's rough. It was my daughter's 13th birthday today. I now have 13, 16, and 18, essentially. It's a shit show. My girls are my life, and I absolutely love being a girl dad, sports parent, and all things associated with being the primary parent. Until COVID hit, my ex's job kept her on the road and fairly busy for the last 10 years. Between her job and her CrossFit gym addiction, she had checked out of our marriage and parenting gig long before the affair with the family friend from her gym. This is the dicey part. This guy once reached out to me when my oldest was struggling badly a couple of years ago. He gave the appearance of, care, of a caring friend and concerned parent. He knows my kids and has been in my house. He and I were not close, but we were certainly friends. Little did I know he was working his way towards banging my wife through their gym connection. My ex's behavior changed dramatically after our 20th anniversary in 2018. She had been spending less and less time at home and getting back from trips very late, only to disappear to the gym for hours on end every weekend. At this time, our daughters were 13, 15, and 17. I asked her several times if something was going on with a person from the gym because that was the only other place she spent any time besides work. We eventually filed for divorce in December, and around that time, I heard I had heard from some of some people and uncovered some evidence that she was cheating. The info was irrefutable, and she admitted to it. It was public, embarrassing, and incredibly hurtful for both me and my kids. I have never spoken to or run into this douchebag in town since I learned of the cheating. My ex moved in with him last summer, 
One of my girls refuses to stay there, and the other one, in parentheses, still at home, stays there a couple nights a week. None of them like the guy, but they tolerate him. My middle daughter is graduating from high school next week, and my ex chose the Friday before our daughter's grad party to inform us all that she is marrying this piece of shit. Yes, she made the party and graduation entirely about her rather than her daughter, which of course just fuels even more of my hatred for this guy, and maybe for her too. Now that they've told people they're getting married, she has started to bring him to my kids' events. The first was the graduation party. We both kept our distance, but the tension was obvious to most people there who knew the situation. My kids and several friends ran interference to help avoid an issue, and we all had a good time. I have never said or done anything to him. I've tried to take the high road and just be a good dad to my girls. But I'm also a believer in protecting my family. And when someone fucks with that sacred ground, then there are consequences. Tolerating this asshole feels like condoning what happened and accepting it as standard oh well behavior. I'd love to tell the guy what a piece of shit he is and deliver a palm strike to the face or a kick to the nuts. But then I would rob him of the asshole title and place that crown on my head. Yet doing nothing still feels cowardly. What would you do in my situation and why? Goddamn, man. You know what? First and foremost, it's fucking awesome that your girls are your priority in your life and that you love everything about being their dad and going to their sporting events and that you love everything about being that primary parent. Like, you know what? Like, out of all of this email, that's what I love the most. The situation that you are describing sucks it sucks but i love your headspace and where your time energy and effort is focused now to the situation at hand what a shit show but what i think if this was public which you said it was and embarrassing and incredibly hurtful for both you and your kids the die has been cast for your kids to make their own decisions. And they're going to come to those decisions in time. 13, 15, and 17, when they found out about this, there's some pretty advanced processing power there. They're going to process at different times, but they are old enough to understand what happened. And the more time they spend with you and the more time that they spend with their mother and this new person, the more data points they are going to continue to collect and then be able to work their way through. Uh, I have three kids myself. Obviously, I'm just out of a divorce. Uh, I've been divorced for about four months now, and the process took nearly two years. My kids were about this age um, during that process, and all three of them have reacted to it pretty differently. Um, And I don't think there should be any attempt by you, and hopefully not from your ex-wife, to change that. I think one of the worst things that you can do is tell your children in a situation like this what it is they should think and what it is they should do. Uh, in Montana, 15 is the legal age, from my, under- my understanding. I mean, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. The legal age for children to decide who they want to spend their time with. So I can share custody with my children, with my ex, but if they don't want to spend time with me, I suppose I could force them, but they are at a legal age to be able to make their decision. My theory on that is that it should be respected. I want my kids to want to spend time with me, not to feel like they have to spend time with me. And it has played out uh, exactly that way. I spend as much time with my kids as possible without interrupting their day-to-day and their school home life uh, balance that they have at their mom's house. But I'm constantly in contact and they're always, uh, not always, but they're constantly asking me uh, to do things as well. And I take that as a positive sign. Well, my oldest son, he didn't speak to me for almost 18 months. Um, I consistently reached out to him, but I respected his space and never once, not a single time during that time period did I force him to spend time with me. And for the last month and a half, he's been living with me full time. And I'd say right now, we're actually getting probably closer and communicating better than we ever have in our lives. And it's an amazing thing. And I think some of that is because I didn't force him when he didn't want to. So I'm going to shut the fuck up about me and talk about you. The whole point in that is you don't actually have to say a lot to your kids about this because they have two eyes and two ears as well. Now, having said that, you do absolutely have to protect them. The person that you need to protect them from is not your ex-wife's future husband. It's your ex-wife. You need to sit down and create 
boundaries and expectations and have a very serious conversation with your ex-wife. Uh, I'm going to find the sentence here. She made the party and graduation entirely about her rather than her daughter, which of course just fuels even more of my hatred for this guy and maybe for her too. Your wife is the one who turned the graduation party into a celebration or an attempted celebration of her marriage announcement, not this guy. So that's the person that you need to be focusing this energy on. And I say that because she is the co-parent or she should be the co-parent. You guys will always be connected and will always be a family and you can use whatever description of that you want to, but your kids genetically are a mix of both of you. You're right. You have a mom and a dad and there's no way that you can, that you can change that, nor should you want to change that. So you're going to have to have some level of relationship with the mother to effectively co-parent. That's the person you need to be spending the time talking to about these things. You're never going to be able to control that other dude and completely understand how you would want to go and beat the crap out of this guy. And to be honest with you, there's a time and place for that in my mind. That would be, though, if he ever puts your daughters into a physically threatening situation or, you know, putting them into a position that was unsafe. They threatened you that they he threatened you uh, some type of physical altercation that was forced upon you. And again, I'm not trying to like list everything where in my mind it would rise to that criteria. What I'm saying is there's a time and place for that. But I would recommend that your effort go right back into your ex-wife, which is probably the last place you want it to be, because there's a good chance you might hate that motherfucker. But she's the mother of your kids. So I would have honest conversations with your children as well. So talk to your wife first. Let me go ex-wife route. Talk to your ex-wife. And lay out your concerns. Is she going to respect them? Probably not. Is she going to say stupid shit to you? Probably. Is she going to do things that probably are going to upset you? Yeah, most likely. And that's okay because that's highlighting her behavior, not yours. What you should be doing is exactly what you said you're already doing. Focusing on being a girl dad, the sporting events, and making these kids prior uh, the priority and primary in your life. Because I'm going to tell you right now, they are going to navigate and drift towards the person that they feel the most comfortable with, that is the most enriching to their life and the most empowering to their life. Uh, You already said that one of your daughters, you know, will tolerate this individual. uh, And that sucks. But again, that's a choice that they have to make. And there probably will be a point in time where they're no longer willing to tolerate that individual. And so what they're going to do is no longer tolerate spending time with their mother as well. And guess whose problem that is? That is hers, not yours. Spend your time, energy, and effort as much as you can, as much as you can tolerate, as much as you can stomach, trying to at least lay the foundation for successful co-parenting with your ex-wife. If that fails and she doesn't want to do anything or even take the time to discuss with you anything, and she actually even wants to put roadblocks in your way, let her be the best father that you can be. Stay relevant in your daughter's lives. Have open and honest conversations with them. Let them vent to you. Don't ever vent to them and let them make up their own mind. And this might be a battle of months or years, but you will win it at the in the end um, because then that's what's important. You want to win the actual war itself. And I hate to use that analogy. Win the war, not the battles. Uh, And as far as this guy goes. Uh, do everything you can. You know, avoid him at all costs. If he forces you into a situation where you feel like you need to take action, well, you know, do what you think is right. Question number three, subject butt plug. Pfft, tell me more. In the wake of Memorial Day, every year I see guys from my old infantry unit post the names of guys that gave it all on Facebook. The thing is, I often see the names of guys that got out of the military and then went on to take their own lives included in this list of names that have been KAA. Honestly, that doesn't sit well with me. I'm not trying to diminish those lives, but I just don't feel that those men should be honored on that day. Do you have any thoughts on this matter? Well, what day do you think they should be honored on? I've said it before. I'm sure I'll say it plenty more times. If you touch war, it will touch you back. And you don't have to be a mathematician to look at the suicide rate when it comes to military members, specifically uh I would say, well, actually, I can't. I was going to. I was about to say from Vietnam forward, but I think it is combat related, or, or 
military members who served in combat and their likelihood from a statistical perspective to end their life versus those who didn't serve in the military. One is higher than the other. Uh, I think there's a reason for that. And I am not an expert at any of this. Uh, I don't have a list of things that I can say for from A to Z that make me feel that it uh, they're more com or not more common, but more likely to take their life. But that's the reality of it. Um, and again, if we're not going to celebrate the lives of people on Memorial Day who chose to end their life, likely due to the experiences and the weight that they have carried forward from that job on Memorial Day, then what fucking day are we going to do it on? Um, I would say if you're uncomfortable with them being listed on Memorial Day, to a degree, you are actually trying to diminish those lives. Um, you know, on Memorial Day, do they list or break out soldiers who were di uh, killed in training accidents versus those in combat? No, they do not, uh, because they were both in uniform at the time, and they make no delineation between those that died in peacetime and those that died in wartime. There's a reason for that. It doesn't fucking matter. I mean, I guess there's a difference for sure, but they died in service of their country. I personally feel that if you leave military service, but the baggage you bring with you takes you to a place that you decide the only option that you have is to end your life and fuck, I wish nobody would get to that point. And I can't say that I truly understand what it feels like when you do get to that point, but I have complete and utter empathy for it. In my opinion, if there's a breadcrumb trail that's leading you back to your time in service, and, and that was at least, uh, I mean, not causal, but corollary to your decision, I don't think there's anything that diminishes those that died while wearing the uniform and those that chose to take their life because of things that happened while they were wearing uniform that they were unable to shake. Just my personal opinion. Um, and until we can find a way to celebrate them separately, if people think that that's necessary, I think it very highly diminishes them if you were to strip them away on Memorial Day. And again, that's just my personal opinion. Uh, and maybe I'm an asshole. I don't know, but that's how I feel about it. And that is all. Moving on. Last question. Burnout and turning 30 is the subject line. I'm about to turn 30 years old. I realize that's not really old, no matter how you twist and turn it. But still, I've had some problems mentally. Lately, I've been feeling empty, lost, and just unmotivated. I used to be really into working on cars. I have five classics and my boat. I've stayed in shape and have worked out six to seven times a week. Now, suddenly, all of my interest in cars, motors, wrenching, etc. has just died off. I now no longer care about any of the cars and quite frankly prefer to drive the wife's car around. I've fallen out of interest with most of my hobbies and I actually find myself having to force myself to go to the range and shoot. I haven't worked out in months and no matter what I tell myself or how well padded the guy in the mirror has become, I just can't tie on the running shoes or hit the weights. It all just seems like a big waste of time and money. I realize I should probably seek help slash somebody to talk to, but in my current job situation, I cannot even come close to afford that. This is turning into quite the novel, and I'm not good with words. This is my fourth attempt at getting it down without having it being total nonsense, so I'll sum it up. Have you ever found yourself in a similar situation, and if so, how did you pull yourself out of the hole? I cannot say I've found myself in a situation like this, but... I have had to pull myself out of a hole a few times, and there's two ways that I've been able to do it. One was seeking professional help. Now, you were saying in your current job situation, you cannot even come close to affording that. And I have a question for you. How the fuck do you have five classic cars in a boat, and you can't dedicate some time and money to taking care of yourself? So maybe sit down a little bit and look at the amount of money you have spent on those things. Maybe look at getting rid of one of those classics, and you'll have an excess and surplus amount of money that you can use to devote to yourself the actual machine that needs to get you around in day-to-day -day life to get you to your classic cars and your boats. So one way for me has been seeking professional help. The other way is confining in friends and not isolating myself and using the power of a group, a tribe, or a community to pull me up by the bootstraps a little bit and, you know, give me, you know, sometimes you need to pull people up the ladder and... You know, sometimes you need to be able to reach your hand out and take somebody's hand so they can pull you up. And other times you need to be the hand that is pulling people up. So it sounds to me like you're in that place where you need a little bit of external 
motivation. And there's nothing better that I have found than finding a peer group or leveraging the peer group that you have to hold you accountable. Now with that though, I would actually recommend that you go get uh, a screening. I would go get a blood test and I would take a good look at your hormones. Now, obviously I'm not a doctor, but uh, I've been asked questions like this enough and I've had feedback from people saying pretty much every time I will talk about something like this, make sure that you go get your blood checked and checked out and have your hormones checked, your testosterone, all sorts of good stuff. Go to a professional and get a look underneath the hood, right? There's one between the ears and then, you know, all the stuff that's actually making your body function a little bit. You may be uh, suffering from a deficiency in one or more things. And if you can correct those, a lot of the things that you described, they might actually fix themselves. Um, I don't think it's uncommon to go through sine waves throughout your life. And I actually think that you should expect to go through sine waves. It's not going to be all, you know, rainbows and green meadows and fucking gummy bears falling from the sky. If that is your life, please immediately reach out to me and let me know how you did that because I would love to know how to replicate it. I've never been able to. And actually, I don't think I would want to because if you look at the sine wave and the ups or the peaks and the downs or the valleys, for me, what gives me appreciation for the uptimes are the downtimes. And I learn a lot more about myself in those downtimes than I do the up. I also learn a lot more about my social circle and my true friends in my downtimes, as opposed to when you're in the up, when everybody wants to be around you because everything is going great. You can be the life of the party and you are pulling people along with you. If there's a huge difference between who's there on your uptimes and who's there on your downtimes, I would say reevaluate your social circle. But the bottom line is everything you described, I think is fixable. You could go for that professional help and seriously sit down and look at your monetary allocation between your hobbies and then do me a favor, write me another email and let me know how you can justify spending money on that stuff, but not yourself. Dial in your social circle, find a buddy who is going to go to the gym with you or put running shoes on and hold you accountable. It's a lot harder to say no to something when somebody's knocking on your door trying to hold you accountable and start slow. Um, for me, long-term growth and progress comes from very, very small steps that are layered one after the other. So just like you're pushing a snowball downhill and you want to turn it into a massive, massive ball of snow that could smash a building, it's going to start with a, with a granule of snow, start building it, build that momentum slowly, and then keep it going from there. And that's all I have for Friday. Hope everybody has a great weekend. See you on Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and Share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero-star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com. And there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you could tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.